looks like this mapping puzzle is not going to go away. The objection that is regularly thrown at flat earthers is that without a map, there's no case to answer. And I recall saying some time ago that we don't need a map, but it's a nice thing to have. So let's try and pick this up where we left off. For those of you who've listened so far, you may recall that back in episode 6, I showed why I thought the flat circular layout provided the only realistic alternative to the globe. The dew line that was built across the top of Canada seems to preclude all the flat earth maps that have the North Pole at the edge or at one of the corners. I also recall saying that I've seen no credible evidence for the giant waffle that needs everything to fall off one edge, missiles and all, and pop back up on the other edge. So I'm inclined to dispose of the giant waffle post haste and move on to more important things. The story so far seems to suggest that the only real layouts that might work are the flat circular maps, or it's back to the globe again. They seem to show the same thing, except that one of them has a curved surface and the other is flat. There are hundreds of reasons to believe that the surface is flat, and each of us have preferences about which ones are sufficient to prove it ourselves. Most people seem to like Alex Gleason's layout, and once you get past the pointless objections about spelling mistakes, it's fairly easy to see what goes where. But let's be clear here. There are dozens of maps that claim to show what the Earth looks like. The United Nations map and its various spin-off agencies was designed in 1948. The Hammonds Air Age map that was made in 1943. Alex Gleason's map was made in 1892. Samuel Rowbottom's layout was made in the 1860s, and this French map was made in 1781. There's even this Oriental map that's claimed to date back to the 10th century. From time to time, other maps also seem to pop up, showing the same layout beyond the Antarctic Circle. And while some also claim to show more land beyond the Antarctic Circle, it's hard to give them any credibility beyond some wishful thinking. The limits of the Antarctic really are as far as we can go for the time being. It seems that the world that's bounded by the Antarctic Circle shows a fairly consistent layout, but there are one or two things that need looking at a bit more closely. I'm going to use Alex Gleason's map again as a start point, because it's a fairly clean map but it contains a lot of additional information that I don't really need for the moment. So let's see if we can simplify things. Alex Gleason's map is claimed to have been created as the basis for a timekeeping device that he patented at the end of the 19th century. And while it's an interesting proposition in itself, we really only need the mapped land masses for the purposes of building a map of the world. Most people recognise it as it stands, but let's see if we can clean it up a bit more. The first thing is to trim the extras away for a moment, and rotate the map so that the prime meridian runs down from the middle. For anyone who can't hear an accent, I live in the UK, and I've grown accustomed to working with the map this way around, but you can turn it any way that suits your purposes. To simplify things further, I've retraced the layout so that we can concentrate on the land masses and add the bits we need as we go along. It shows the land masses that most of us recognise, with the Antarctic running around the outside edge and the North Pole at the middle. I've also taken the liberty of putting Mount Meru back at the North Pole and based on Mercator's map as an alternative to the blank, empty space that the globe seems to suggest. One of the ways by which the detractors seem to explain this layout away is to claim that it's nothing more than a projection of the globe. If you believe that the world is flat, I would suggest that it's really what Alex Gleason states it to be. 
it shows the world as it is, and in reality it is the globe which is a projection of the flat circular world. This layout does still present us with a few problems though, specifically that some of the distances still seem to be off, and perhaps some of the land masses are not quite where we think they are. I suppose the first place to start is to take a closer look at the scale. If we go to the bottom of Alex Gleason's map, there's a scale that most of us have seen, but not really thought about too closely. Nowadays, most people seem content to accept the metric unit of kilometres as their basis for measuring distances, but they're a fairly modern contrivance, and hopefully most of you still have a working sense of miles. Alex Gleason's map shows two scales, side by side, using nautical miles and English or land miles. Nautical miles are generally used for navigation at sea or in the air, and need not concern us too much here, except to say that they are built on the globular model that used the stars to navigate out in the oceans, where there were no recognisable points of reference. Modern GPS seems to have done away with much of that, although any good navigator will understand the difference. Nautical miles also work well for the globular model, which uses units that are multiples of 60, that work well with circles but are not much use anywhere else. If we look a little closer at the scale, you'll find that there are 60 nautical miles for each circular degree, and is convenient only because the degrees on any circle are subdivided into sixtieths and the units work well together. All circles are divided into 360 degrees. Take a look at any protractor and you'll see that they are all the same. The scale on Alex Gleason's map shows that each degree on the map corresponds to 60 nautical miles but a closer look shows that 60 nautical miles is the same as 69 land miles, with which most of us are reasonably familiar. So each degree on the map is equivalent to 69 miles. I'm going to work with land miles as it's something that most of us are familiar with, and most of us could go out and get some sense of how big a land mile really is. There are many circles on Alex Gleason's map, but there are only two places on the layout where we can define a scaled circle around which we could measure out 360 degrees, around the edge and around the equator. Using the scale on his map, 360 degrees, where each degree is 69 miles long, would give us a circle that measures 24,840 miles. Is that figuring any bells? It should do. For all practical purposes, it's the length of the equator around the globe. I don't want to get too waylaid with numbers for a moment, as it seems to put some people off. I'll ask you to accept my numbers for a moment, as I'm more concerned to give an overview of what they might really mean, and I'll show the number sheets at the very end for those who'd like to see them in more closely. I'm not one for coincidences. So if the length of the equator on the flat circular layout is the same as the globe, we might be heading in the right direction. Let's see where they go. If we accept that the equator is the right length, it means that the diameter of the circle that is bounded by it would be a touch under 8,000 miles, and so the diameter of the whole flat circular layout would be a touch under 16,000 miles. One step on from there would give us a total circumference for the flat circular world as a shade under 50,000 miles. It's interesting if you take a look back at the voyages of James Cook and see how long he took to sail around the Antarctic. When most of us first encountered the flat earth, we generally accepted polar distances as given and one of the biggest criticisms to date of the circular map is that it seemed much bigger than the globe. Two and a half times bigger to be precise. But if we now use these smaller figures, we can work out that the surface area of the circular map is roughly 
196 million square miles. A cursory search for the surface area of the globe will show that it's pretty much the same size. There will undoubtedly be a few detractors who will shout that the globe is about half a million square miles bigger. So to provide some context, half a million square miles is about the size of Sweden. The difference between the two models is the size of Sweden. For all practical purposes, they're the same size. If we dig a little deeper, it throws up something else that might interest you. On a flat circular map, the Arctic Circle and the Antarctic Circle are both a touch over 66 degrees from the equator, areas that the likes of you and me are unlikely to ever visit, but it gives us a band around the edge and around the North Pole that is off limits. If we take the total surface area and subtract the central section that is bounded by the Antarctic Circle, it shows that the area outside the Antarctic Circle covers some 48 million square miles. And with the Arctic covering a further 3.5 million, it means that of the total surface area of the world, there is a little over 26% that's off limits to you and to me. That is one quarter of your world that is out of bounds, but with a globe that seems to suggest that it's just some chilly little zone at the top and one at the bottom. So I ask a question, how much of your world do you really know? It seems almost incredible that so much of the world could be hidden before your eyes, but it might not be as hard as it first appears. By whatever means the flat circular world was hidden, we have to acknowledge that it was done with some considerable thought and that many of the great minds of this world have not so much lied as they've massaged the truth. The countries that are spread around the world certainly exist, so the globe can't be a complete fabrication, rather that the truth has been pulled and pushed to fit their model. Pressing on, if the surface area of the flat circular world is the same as that of the globe, why do some of the distances seem so wide of the mark. Surely they can't be that wrong. In truth, I'm not sure they are that wrong. I just don't think we always look as close as we should. We base our sense of scale on the figures we're given, rather than what they might really be. So let's see if we can tighten things up a bit more. If we accept that the surface area is pretty much on the mark, the only difference is the placement of the land masses themselves. We can keep the equator where it is on the flat circular world. That seems to measure up for the time being. But I invite you to think back to episode 6 for a moment and recall the exercise where I drew the circular map then wrapped it around a ball. Keep that idea in mind for a moment and take another look at the globe. For the sake of familiar terminology, let's stick with calling everything inside the equator as the Northern Hemisphere, and everything outside of it to be the Southern Hemisphere. The globe is just a ball whose circumference matches the equator, so the top half will be the Northern Hemisphere, and the bottom half will be the Southern Hemisphere. If we take the Northern Hemisphere on flat map, and use it to cover the top half of the ball, everything would have to expand. And if we took the southern hemisphere from the flat map and wrapped it around the bottom half of the ball, everything would necessarily shrink. In a nutshell, turning the flat circular map into a globe means expanding the northern hemisphere land masses and shrinking those that are in the southern hemisphere. Another way to think about how the map has been distorted is to consider that on a flat circular map, the southern hemisphere, which is everything outside the equator, has an area that is three times that of the northern hemisphere. On a globe, the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere are the same size. So to make the flat circular map into a globe with the same sized equator, 
means that the areas in the northern hemisphere be doubled in size and those in the southern hemisphere be dropped by one third and hey presto, you have your globe. Anyone who's familiar with the Gold Peters projection will know that there is some controversy about the actual sizes of the continents. To wit, that the imperialistic northern hemisphere continents were expanded by Mercator and the southern hemisphere continents were reduced. If the Gold Peters projection has any truth to it, the globe becomes decidedly small when it comes to accommodating more accurate landmasses. In short, they don't fit. Our flat circular world has been distorted by expanding the northern hemisphere and shrinking the southern hemisphere. So I have another question for you. If the world has been distorted, how has it been hidden? It's really rather easy. But before we go any further, I'd like to add something else to the map. On the basis that the equator seems to be the correct length on this map, we can dispense with any further need to convert circular measurements into distances and use the map to provide its own scale. The equator on the flat circular world gives us a diameter of about 8,000 miles. If we use that distance as a yard stick, it's fairly easy to scale it up and provides us with a fairly accurate scale that can then be used to measure any other distance on the map. I've used this one and split it down to 1,000 mile steps that can then be used to measure the flat distances between points on the map. I've also marked off the distances in kilometers for those of you who prefer metric units but I'll continue using miles for the sake of continuity. It seems that the illusion has been to make the Northern Hemisphere appear bigger and the Southern Hemisphere to appear smaller than they actually are. So to go from the globe back to the flat circular map needs only that we shrink the Northern Hemisphere landmasses and expand the Southern ones back to their proper sizes. If you think for a moment about how we navigate around the world, on the land, most of us don't generally travel far enough for the differences to be noticeable, but in the air and over the oceans, it's another matter. On the oceans and in the air, we never travel directly from A to B. Aircraft and ships are confined to very specific flight corridors and shipping lanes with the exception of short domestic flights by private pilots, pilots don't plan the details of their route beyond putting the destination into a computer called a flight management system, which then controls the plane over the route that it's taken. Flights in the Northern Hemisphere can very easily be made to appear to be longer than the distance from A to B. The Southern Hemisphere is a little different. There are no short cuts on the flat earth, so the southern hemisphere is generally hidden by routing almost all air traffic into the northern hemisphere and then back out again. The travel time is so stretched that it's hard to establish exact distances. If you go to any standard reference, all the distances between different places around the world will be provided and calculated using the globe. They have to be to continue supporting the model. If we're to tighten things up, we can't really rely on the globular distances to figure out the layout of a flat circular world. There have been one or two people who've tried to figure out what the map looks like and all seem to run into problems when things didn't fit. In all cases that I can think of, They've used the listed distances, which have almost certainly been flight distances. And we've seen that with the majority of air travel passing through the Northern Hemisphere, they will almost certainly have been inflated. We might have a little more success if, instead of using the published distances, we consider another method for measuring them. Nobody can go up into the sky with a tape measure and measure the distances but perhaps we could figure them out more accurately if we used flight times and plane speeds instead. 
The shorter domestic and continental flights are fairly easy to follow over a flat circular map. So let's take a closer look at the intercontinental flights. The Antarctic is a well-known no-fly zone for regular commercial flights and perhaps the naysayers who continue to assert that passenger aircraft fly over there every day should take a closer look at the flight regulations. For all practical purposes, it really is a no-fly zone. More recently, the North Pole has entered the fray after NASA declared that radiation at the North Pole means that overflight is not possible there either. So we're confined to the area between the Arctic and the Antarctic circles for purposes of passenger travel. As I've already mentioned, intercontinental flights never fly directly from A to B. They are confined to very specific flight routes and certain countries are effectively no-fly zones. Pilots don't take off with a map and navigate to the destination. Regular commercial pilots generally supervise the safe takeoff and landing of the plane and the flight management system controls the entire flight. During the flight, the pilot is available to deal with emergencies and if necessary, to change the route if required and if permitted to do so by the air traffic control. Once the plane has left the ground, most passengers spend the bulk of the flight sipping cocktails or coffee until they fall asleep. Once airborne, the scenery becomes pretty monotonous and there's not much to see once you get above the clouds. Flying over the flat, circular world doesn't provide quite so much scenery as one might expect. The weather on the time of day can make a big difference to how far you can see once you get up into the sky. But if we take a perfectly clear day, there is a rough calculation that pilots and scientists use to gauge visibility, and that at 35,000 feet, which is the average height for intercontinental flight, its visibility is about 170 miles. That means that at any point over the Earth, you can see no further than that. For all practical purposes, once you're over the oceans, there is nothing to see no pun intended, and your only real point of reference will be the pretty display on the back of the seat in front of you. You really are flying blind. So, to return to our flying times, let's look at the matter in another way. There are really only two flights that the naysayers make much noise about. The non-stop flight from Santiago, which is in Chile, to Sydney in Australia, and the flight from Johannesburg in South Africa to Perth, which is also in Australia. If you do a quick search for the flying routes for each of these flights, you'll generally get the globular interpretation and little else. There is no alternative for those who still think we live in a little ball. Given what I've said so far about the actual visibility from an intercontinental flight, our knowledge of how accurate those routes really are becomes somewhat questionable. So let's go back to basics. If we accept that the flat circular layout is credible and based on the length of the equator, the distances I've used are actually quite realistic. We can take another look at those flights and see what we can find. I'll do the easy one first. A direct flight from Johannesburg to Perth can be measured to be about 6,700 miles. The service is provided using Airbus A340-600 aircraft that have a top speed of 608 miles per hour. The flight is scheduled to take 11 hours and 10 minutes, which means the plane can cover 6,789 miles with no appreciable help from tailwinds. A direct flight from Santiago to Sydney is a bit more demanding. The scale distance can be measured to be about 9,700 miles. The service is provided using Boeing 747-400 aircraft, which also have a top speed of 608 miles per hour. The flight is scheduled to take 14 hours and 10 minutes, 
which means the plane can cover 8,613 miles, but leaves a shortfall on the scaled distance of about 1,000 miles. Given that 747s are not plopping into the ocean off the coast of Australia, I'm inclined to suggest that the times and distances can be tweaked in a number of ways. I based all the calculations using the published specifications and suspect that they probably have tolerances over and above those that are given and so planes probably fly a little faster or when not fully loaded. I've also not taken account of prevailing wind speeds which can help reduce flight times or increase the distance covered. Anybody who's taken an eastbound flight across the Atlantic knows that the flights generally gain about an hour on a six hour flight against their published times that are credited to favourable tailwinds. The Abu Ishmael channel offered a very credible explanation to account for favourable flight times around the Southern Oceans where there are consistent high speed winds that can provide an advantage when flying. Colloquially, they're known as the Roaring Forties and certainly help to add to the distances covered. Finally, I'd like to offer one more factor that might serve to mitigate the shortfall. Australia might not be where we think it is. That's no idle speculation. If you go to timeanddate.com and take a look at the angle at which the sun rises, I'll use Sydney at the equinoxes for a moment, you'll see that the sun approaches Sydney from a 90 degree angle and suggests that Sydney is much closer to the equator than we are given to believe. I'll talk more of this later. The flights I've used here really are the extreme. They are the longest direct flights and if you go and search for flights between these destinations you'll soon find that they're really quite rare. Most flights between these locations have at least one stop and most have two or three. On the few occasions where they do fly directly there's not much information about the routes themselves and while we've generally accepted that they take the route over the oceans on a globe it's very realistic for them to take a much straighter route over the flat circular map and remain far enough from land for you to have no real idea how close you are to the continents. So, in closing, this map seems to answer some of the questions that the flat circular map seems to bring from those who seek to debunk the map and the flat earth. It is by no means an assertion by me that this is what the map of the world looks like, but it certainly seems to answer some of the questions that we may have about the shape and layout of the world. If the flat circular map is the same size as the globe, and the land masses have simply been distorted, the only difference between the flat circular world and the globe is that one of them has a curved surface and the other is flat. That's your decision to make. If there is any value in this map, we might learn a little more with some help from our fellow flatheads at the other side of the world. Perhaps there's more for us to learn. Thank you for listening.